Welcome to a brand new video on Kubernetes authentication and more specifically on using OpenID Connect tokens to authenticate against our Kubernetes cluster. We're finally at a point where we can point our API server in the Kubernetes cluster or more specifically in the Minikube cluster that we have up and running to use the um, identity provider and token issuer that we've spun up in the previous episode. If you don't know how OpenID Connect works, don't worry, just watch the OpenID Connect video first. And if you don't have your um, identity provider and token issuer up and running yet, just watch the video on spinning up Keycloak. We've used Keycloak for this purpose in the past video. Let's move to the terminal and get started. In the previous video, we've uh, created a Keycloak instance and uh, we're using that with a Docker setup here. If you don't have that code ready yet and you don't want to go through the video, you can just git clone this repository and follow the instructions in the readme. I've already done that, so no need uh, for me to do it right now. All I want to do is a Docker compose up minus D, so it runs in detached mode in the background. It doesn't block my terminal here. And uh, this will now make sure um, that Keycloak is running on your machine and then you can point your browser to localhost 8443 and that's an HTTPS. And there's Keycloak and then you can log into the administration console and the dummy passwords. I'm already logged in, but the uh, dummy passwords would be admin and pass as configured in the uh, Docker Compose file. So our very first challenge here is for our Minikube cluster, which runs in a virtual machine, to discover this Keycloak instance, which runs on my host machine. It, it is running in a Docker container, but it's currently exposed onto localhost here. And localhost, of course, has a very different meaning inside of this virtual machine as it would have on, on my machine. So if we take a look at this token issuer URL and go to our uh, browser, uh, sorry, uh, to our console, I can easily curl this here because I'm on my machine. But if I go Minikube, I've already started Minikube in the background. It's just, um, it doesn't have any sort of specific configuration just to have a VM uh, with Minikube running. If I do a Minikube SSH in here and try to do the exact same thing, curl to here, then, uh, well, I need to specify the minus K option because I'm not specifying the certificate authority. Then I am getting some sort of completely different response. And this is actually coming from the Kubernetes API because inside of this Minikube machine on port 8443, there's the, the um, and the Kubernetes API, the API server running, and not our Keycloak instance at all, which is running outside of the VM on my host machine. Luckily, this is quite easy to fix though, because I'm uh, spinning up Minikube or I'm using Minikube with the default configuration, which means it uses VirtualBox for its virtualization in the background. And on VirtualBox, there's a magic IP in this network that points to the host machine. So if we simply replace the uh, local host here with 10.0.2.2 and then go to port 8443 uh, and auth realms master, then we get the same response that we got before. So um, this is not uh, Mac OS specific. This should be the same on Linux or in Windows, but it is VirtualBox specific. So if you're not using VirtualBox, but another uh, virtualization for Minikube, then you might have to change this IP. And this magic IP is also not very well documented anywhere. There's a GitHub issue where um, someone basically just says, yeah, this works and here's the magic IP, you can use that. And that's actually where I got it from some time ago as well. So yeah, I can't really tell you where exactly it's coming from or if you can configure this somewhere within VirtualBox, but I know that it works and I've seen it working in uh, local CI setups where people use Minikube in their, in their local tests and on CI. And uh, yeah, this works consistently across machines. So next up, before we configure our um, Minikube API server to use this uh, token issuer, what we haven't done yet so far is um, inspect one of those tokens to see what they look like and even retrieve a token. And the easiest way to do that is just to use the uh, password grant floor, flow. And for that, let's just go back to our uh, discovery um, page and take the token endpoint here. And with that, we can do a curl minus K because we're not specifying, specifying the certificate authority and a minus X post to that URL and that'll give us some error saying invalid request missing parameter grant type, but we can add that. 
and it's more than just the grand type it's missing this has to be specified with the minus d option so it's a form uh, encoded body and the first one is the grand type as i said password is the easiest for our example here it does come with a very big uh, disadvantage which is basically we have to send the user credentials with this request so it might not be the safest way for production but uh, perfectly fine for our example here next up is the client id in the previous video we've created a client called kubernetes cluster if you haven't watched the previous video and just run the docker compose command please log into the um, keycloak ui and create this client it doesn't need any specific configuration it just needs to be called whatever you specify here and then we have to specify the username and i'm using the admin user here which is of course also very far from a production use case the keycloak admin would not be used to retrieve a token to log into the um, kubernetes cluster but for a simple testing example that's perfectly fine and the password was pass so let's run that and what we see here is we get well, don't see anything really because it's quite hard to see but jq makes it a bit easier um, we get a access token and we get a refresh token here however an access token is not what we want if we go back to here and look at the uh, docs it tells you somewhere up here to identify the user the authenticator uses the id token not the access token so that's not quite what we want however we can we can get that if we turn the scope to open ID and then specify the respond response type equals to ID underscore token. And again, pipe that into JQ just to make it a bit easier to see. Then we have an ID token here as well now. So let's modify our JQ option here a bit. Let's only get the ID token and the minus R option so it removes the quotes around it. So there's the token and now I can pipe it into PB copy. PB copy is Mac OS specific, just um, to copy it into the clipboard. This might be a different command on your operating system or you can just use Tmux or the mouse or whatever way you want to uh, copy this. And I want to copy this because now I can paste it into JWTIO. And in here, I already had a token from before. Let's remove that first and paste that here. And now we can take a look at this token. Okay, so why did I want to inspect this token? Two reasons, basically. One is just to show how it works, what Kubernetes will do with this token. And the other is to highlight an upcoming problem that will be quite easy to fix. Um, but first, how, how, what does Kubernetes do with that? Remember, this is an ID token, not an access token. So this is not about authorization at all. Authorization will happen within the cluster using RBAC or could potentially use groups in the token as well. Um, but this token is about identifying the user. So this is to prove that whoever claims they are is actually who they are. And that is usually done with the subject field. So the su subject field in this case here is a UUID that um, points to this specific user. It is just our admin user. And this admin user also doesn't have an email configured. Otherwise we might get the field email. And email is very valid because emails are, are globally unique. So emails are a very valid way for um, identifying the person based on their token as well. In this case, since we don't have the email, we'll probably go with the uh, subject here, but that's as easy as changing uh, a single parameter in the configuration. However, there's another issue coming up. We just told our Minikube cluster, or didn't tell it yet, but we just found out that we will have to tell it, the API server in there, uh, to use this magic IP from VirtualBox, which is 10.0.2.2. Um, however, the token now says, okay, I was issued by localhost 8443. So the first thing the API server will say is, uh, I don't care about this token. This wasn't issued by a, a token issuer that I'm configured to trust because I only trust 10.0.2.2, but this was issued by localhost. So if we want to successfully issue a token on our local machine that uh, will be accepted by our Kubernetes cluster, there is one additional step that we have to do, and that is create a, an IP alias that points to localhost that is called 10.0.2, because if we use that to um, access our key cloak, it will issue a token based on that URL as a token issuer. And on Mac, this is quite easy. 
on, on Linux also, on, on Windows, to be honest, I have no idea. Um, but on Mac, what you can do is sudo ifconfig and then lo0, that's the loopback interface, and just add 10.0, oh, sorry, 2.2, .2, and add the word alias. I need to enter my password. And now I have an alias uh, for that URL configured. So if I go back to our previous request and modify localhost in here and replace it with 10.0.2.2 .2 and run that, I'll re remove the pp copy, otherwise we won't see any output. Then you can see it still works. And if I do add the pb copy again and go back to here and paste that in here again, then you can see that this token was issued for this or issued by this token issuer and this is the one that will also tell our kubernetes api to trust in production of course you would have a uh, c name here or some fully qualified domain name that is a uh, globally reachable and that you have dns configured somewhere so you wouldn't ever run into this problem but uh, i'm a big fan of having everything that you do run also able to run locally because it's much easier for figuring out how stuff works and also quite good to to understand what goes on in the background this does of course also mean that uh, the ssl certificate that we've created um, also needs to be allowed for this specific ip if we issue it for for localhost then the next issue that we would run into is the certificate not being valid for localhost um, but if you just clone my repository i've already made sure to add the magic ip there so if you have a different magic ip um, you would have to to uh, create a different certificate but if I just scroll down here, it might be a bit small to see now because unfortunately the, the zoom uh, doesn't zoom this in, but it does have a, well, this is of course the certificate for JWT IO and that won't tell me anything. But if I go back to Keycloak here, and if I take a look at that certificate and scroll down here a bit, we can see that we have a subject alternative name with an IP address of this IP address. So as long as we trust the certificate authority that signed that certificate, it will be a valid certificate. Okay, so now all we have to do is start up Minikube and uh, configure it to use um, the OpenID issuer that we have here. And I think I already have a Minikube running, so I will just delete that. And now we can do a Minikube start. and add our famous extra config option. And again, it's the API server we're talking about because we want authentication. And then in there we have oidc.issuer URL, and that we can grab from here. So let's go to the next tab here. But again, this has localhost in here. So let's put that to our magic URL. And yes, I haven't trusted this yet. Also, I haven't added the certificate authority. Also, doesn't keep my Zoom settings, apparently. Uh, so we can add this issuer URL here. And as we've explained in the video on OpenID Connect, because it has that URL, it can retrieve this page that we're also viewing in our browser right here. And this contains all the configuration that you ever need. So it's very easy to configure. All you have to do is paste this single URL here. Then we have to add some other configuration, authentication, might be easier to just copy that, not that, but that. And instead of the issuer URL, we now want to point the username claim. And that is, as we said before, uh, this is what will identify the user. And it's easiest to just use the subject here. And then let's copy that line again and replace the username claim with the client ID. So here Kubernetes will check whether this token was actually issued for our client or maybe not for someone else. And this we have pointed to Kubernetes hyphen cluster. So let's start up Minikube and I'll be back once it's running. Cool, looks like it's up and running. Unfortunately, the last attempt didn't quite work yet, and that is because uh, for once I misspelled something and the others I also forgot something. So if we go back here, um, one thing, issuer URL, there's this Go specific syntax of um, writing acronyms, well-known acronyms in um, the same 
uh, capitalization as the beginning of the word. So because the U is here camel cased, that means the rest of the word also needs to be camel cased. So um, we need that. And also, of course, we were talking about self-signed certificates all the time, yet I have not specified um, the CA file here. So even with the issue uh, above uh, fixed, we would probably run into this issue next. So the CA file is, if you're using um, my uh, GitHub repository uh, to spin up Keycloak with Docker Compose file, then it's just the current working directory. If you're in it, slash, root ca.crt if you've used a uh, different uh, root certificate to self-sign your certificate you need to specify there if you're not using a self-signed certificate but one by a trusted authority then you can completely omit that last line okay so let's start it up again and let's see what happens this time cool also started up much faster this time so let's give it a shot so far, we've always been curling the API uh, just to retrieve a list of namespaces to see whether the authentication worked. So let's do the exact same thing again. Let's go to HTTPS minikube IP 8443 for the Kubernetes API to listen on. And API v1 namespaces. Notice I'm not specifying uh, any uh, token right now. So we're expecting a 401 unauthorized even though technically it's more of an unauthenticated. Okay, so um, now that we have that, let's go back in our history and get this thing here for retrieving our token. Instead of piping it into pbcopy, I'll just save it into a file that I will call token. And now if we go back here, we can specify another header. So minus H for authorization. Again, it's technically authentication, but the, the standard calls the header authorization. And there we can have bearer, because it's of uh, the tokens of type bearer, it's a bearer token. And then we can just copy the contents of our token file here. And let's see what happens. We get a response from the Kubernetes API. So we've just successfully authenticated using a uh, OpenID connect token. And just to prove that um, this token is actually being uh, evaluated here, we can now modify this token. And since the last part of the token is the signature, by simply changing one character of the signature, the entire token should be invalid now. So let's try it. And let's go back here with our file. And we get 401 unauthorized because this token has now been messed with. So this concludes our um, basically three part series with, on OpenID Connect within this series on um, authorization, oh, so sorry, on authentication methods for uh, Kubernetes that we've all shown to uh, make work with our Minikube cluster. Now, a couple of things that we ran into here, like the self-signed certificate or the need for the self-signed certificate, and um, also this magic IP here are very specific to a local setup. You will not run into them when you run this in production, when you have a trusted certificate authority, uh, sorry, a trusted uh, open ID identity provider and token issuer that you have a proper certificate for signed by a known authority. Then you can just omit all of this uh, stuff where you point to a specific certificate authority that was used because if you use a trusted one, it'll all automatically be trusted. But basically all of the configuration and all of the flows of how it works will be the same. So I hope you could get quite some interesting learnings out of this small exercise. If you liked it, feel free to subscribe, leave a thumbs up or a comment with feedback on how we can make the next series better. And also of course with wishes for um, other topics to touch on.